Well, I'll go ahead and start. So we'll we'll be able to figure out what we can talk about today, and then um, that'll help us schedule things in uh, in the upcoming sessions. Because I'd like to to continue this and and to use the the local group uh, to reach out to to people that might be interested in this sort of thing, um, as well as to continue um, the sort of the documentation of the process of how we're we're doing this open source work. So so welcome to our our meetup. This is cross-listed with IEEE local group. Um, it's called the Space Frequency Block Coding Review of an Open Source Implementation. So we're uh, going to to talk about a design, an open source design that's been um, uh, targeted uh, for for drones, aerospace, and terrestrial um, at five gigahertz. And this is uh, the the data link or physical layer um, approach uh, with some the upper layers still in development. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And welcome to everybody. This is hosted by uh, Open Research Institute. That's a nonprofit that does open source R and D for open source digital radio. We're headquartered in California, but we have uh, uh, volunteers and participants from all over the world. And this is our first collaborative uh, outreach with uh, IEEE. Uh, IEEE has these, what's called uh, a local groups, and there's an established local group for open source digital radio uh, from the IEEE San Diego section. And IEEE local groups, if you're not familiar with them, they're subject matter focused uh, formal groups from IEEE at the local level. So ours is in, hosted by the San Diego section. Local groups are, are typically organized by IEEE members who share common interests. The, the, so these are different, distinct from the societies and chapters, which I'm, I'm sure that IEEE members are familiar with. And the local groups serve a specific geographic location. And they might be focused on specific technical topics, topics or, or a wide variety of things. So there's, it's really quite unrestricted, uh, kind of nice. So it fills in a lot of gaps in IEEE. And ours is a technical group for open source digital radio. We have a, a strong relationship with ORI, Open Research Institute, and also uh, lots of other developing relationships with other uh, San Diego area uh, universities, um, people, individuals, and companies. So this is the first in a series of opportunities to kind of freely discuss tools, techniques, designs, best practices, and more in digital radio design. And the, the goal here uh, is to help people learn. So for professional development through open source, to give you kind of an edge and to be able to explore things outside of, a, of maybe the commercial uh, view. Um, that doesn't mean it excludes commercial applications, uh, by no means, but uh, by focusing on open source efforts, we're more free to talk about things that that may fill in the gaps in our professional development or personal interest, uh, and also uh, to help open source designs. And so, what we're talking about today is a particular technique that's very uh, that could common in OFDM or, or orthogonal frequency multiplexing designs. Uh, OFDM designs, they're found in, in such an LTE uh, yeah, and 5G. So this is this is called space frequency block coding. And in in this particular image, what we see is what it looks like uh, in our model. So we're modeling our communication system uh, in this OFDM based drone physical layer. A communication system, and we're modeling it in Simulink. So we're using a model-based design approach for this. And in the center of the screen, you can see that after we have put in our cyclic prefix uh, for a time-based series, we're sending that out to the antenna, that we have a custom function, and it's uh, SFBC. And input is the time-based uh, series of samples uh, off to the transmitter. So one stream goes in, two streams come out. We're using a, a two by one uh, MIMO approach. And so you can see the two streams coming out and, and going to the ports in our particular uh, radio frequency IC. Now, if this is all confusing, that's okay. We're gonna back up and, and make sure that everybody here understands everything about, about this particular design. This is the overall architecture. This is where this particular part of the design fits into the, to the model. Um, this model in Simulink is going to be 
processed with H with something called HDL coder or hardware descriptive language coder. This is a particular toolbox from MATLAB and it turns simulate models into HDL, which is human readable. This hardware descriptive language then goes into uh, the reference design for particular RFIC from analog devices, the ADRV, uh, either 9002 or 9009. We have both, uh, depending on the, the bandwidth needed. Um, and then that gets turned into an open source uh, FPGA design to be used over the air. So those those things are all ongoing, uh, you know, continually updated uh, open source designs. So that's that's kind of the context for for this. Uh, Neptune is the project name, and this is an open source OFDM physical air link for drones and aerospace. The specifications are open and the designs are also open. So this is a great learning opportunity if you've never gotten, gotten to really bite into LTE or see the details or be able to play around with it and change things um, you know, outside of a commercial application, then this is, this is a great opportunity. And following sort of the open source mindset, our goal here is to, to get a lot of people to look at it and to give feedback, not just to learn from it, but to also kind of, kind of, uh, pay it back and, and ask questions that will lead to a better design. There are two specifications, or actually one and a half, really. The main specification is called FlexLink. This is based on LTE. It's uh, authored by Andreas Schwarzinger, Verden Schwartz, with Leonard um, Deguez, the project lead for, for Neptune, really pitching in and contributing. It has a subcarrier spacing of approximately 20 kilohertz, uh, several bandwidths are in the specification and quite a bit of configuration. The target frequency band is about 900 megahertz from the, the specification. It's under active development and the revisions can be found at this link. These slides will be in the VTools notice along with the paper. The TrueFlight specification is based on 5G um, and it's heavily leveraged by Andreas. Uh, and then I, I went ahead and, and wrote uh, some specifications and requirements for it to kind of tune it more towards five gigahertz. So it's going to be very simplified compared to uh, FlexLink and it can be found there. So it's a markdown document at this point. Um, it's kind of the biggest difference between the FlexLink and, and TrueFlight is that it follows a, a very simplified sort of uh, frame. So what we'll have is a uplink and downlink control information, and then the rest of the frame will be either uplink or downlink data. So FlexLink is a lot more complicated than this and more flexible. Additional specifications for other bands are welcome. Why? Uh, because what we want to be able to, to provide an OFDM open source uh, communications design, but amateur radio that's, we use the amateur bands for this open source work. They have frequency privileges from very low frequency up to 240 gigahertz and honestly beyond. And there's very, very generous transmit power privileges. So one size doesn't fit all, uh, especially with, with OFDM. What, what do we have to present today? It's a, a document. It's uh, the draft document. It's a, it intended to be an accessible article about space frequency block coding. It's... It's in the VTools media section, and then we'll send out um, the document to all the mailing lists uh, after this is, is over. Uh, so it's about SB SFBC or space frequency block coding in general, and, and specifically about our use case and the design decisions on this particular implementation. And these slides will be there too. Um, and the model that we've been, that we talk about is a, a or the, is a custom MATLAB function. So SFBC is implemented as a, a MATLAB function enclosed in a Simulink block, as you saw in the diagram. And this is part of the overall Simulink model of the transmitter for Neptune. So what we intend to do is to use MATLAB HDL coder to produce an open source HDL code and release that, and then integrate that into the HDL reference design for analog devices to show it working over the air. HDL coder is working up to this point uh, so we do an iterative approach to this and ever so often take a step back, run it everything through HDL coder, make sure that everything is HDL coder compatible, and so far so good. And the use case for Neptune is drones, aerospace, and terrestrial deployments. Um, and for for my, my work or my contribution here, it's for five gigahertz and above.
If you're familiar with space-time block coding, space frequency block coding is a variant of space-time block coding. This is about the most compact way that I, I can come up with to kind of show you the difference. If you're familiar with space-time block coding, it's on the left. And the difference is uh, space frequency block coding on the right. And you can sort of see, this is from the receiver point of view, but the, the left-hand column was from antenna one, the right-hand column is from antenna two. So immediately you can see that for space frequency block coding, we have rearranged our transmit samples and we have the original stream of transmit sam samples from antenna one. So it, it took a while, at least for me, to kind of understand the difference between space time block coding and space frequency block coding, but here it is uh, summarized for you so you can immediately see the difference. So there's a little bit of difference, the, or, the orthogonality of the, the two uh, transmit antennas is, is different. And there's some advantages with space frequency block coding, which is why it was picked for LTE, and is why we, we picked it as well. Here's a... From the transmit side, you have your transmit sample stream coming at you. And uh, if you start out with the beginning of your transmit sample stream for your particular symbol uh, for OFDM, you take X1 and you take X2 and you assign them to antenna one and you have the uh, negative conjugate, complex conjugate of sample two assigned to the first slot, time slot on antenna two, and the complex conjugate not inverted, so not the inverse of positive of, of sample one assigned to antenna two. Now, all of this, all these backflips are very useful uh, because they help you uh, improve the resiliency of your of your transmit stream. And then yeah, there is a, a small bug here. We're actually picking up X3 and X4, not X1 and X2. You know, as time goes on, we we just continue this pattern. So here's here's a close up. This is what it looks like currently in our model, and it's just an inline function. Um, and here's what it it what looks like when you're in the workspace for uh, for the project. So it's just a it's just a function. It's it's uh and it's encapsulated in in Simulink. This is what the function actually looks like. So when you click through on that box, you can see that it's a very short amount of code. There's there's not a lot to it. Here's what it looks like, um, at least to the in the in the simulation. Um, you in order to drop this in there, you we expect about a five microsecond uh, latency. So this is from uh, the point in time where you've put the cyclic prefix in for your OFDM transmitted signal and when you hit antenna one. So what's in between these two things is the space frequency block code um, function and all of the mechanisms that the function needs to do in order to reorder. There's a little bit of a hit of latency because you need to get both X1 and X2 before you can start doing the mathematical transformations. Then you need to assign it to essentially a two by two uh, grid and then it goes out the door. So you can see that at least we have at least a, a 50 uh, microsecond latency, and this is before uh, the, any additional latencies that might have to happen in the RFIC. But but I think this is probably a pretty good um, picture of the the latency hit. So here's a close up of the code, and that's that's what we've got going on so far. It's it's not too uh, complicated looking. It's uh, it's just an implementation of like you have two things, you transform each of those two things, you you put them on the other antenna in the reverse order, and you send it out the door. So after looking at this for a while and realizing that there's you know there is a difference between space time block coding and space frequency block coding, we thought we can modify this particular block in this particular technical demo and show the difference between no transmit diversity at all. In other words, you're just sending out your original transmit stream to the antenna as is. You suffer all that you will suffer with multipath. You just, you know, do your best. Good luck, signal. Um, which not, not too bad. I mean, that's how how a lot of people do it. Um, 
or you can use space time block coding or space frequency block coding and that you decide this uh, you can decide this as, as quickly as every two transmit samples. So we're, we're curious as to whether or not, surely there's some educational value here. You could set up a demo where you, you have a, a pretty difficult channel and you can show the difference between no transmit diversity at all and space frequency or space time block coding. Um, so you have diversity diversity. So is there any reason to adapt to, to kind of like pay attention and to have some sort of closed loop and pick the best transmit diversity um, strategy? Is there any any like potential signal obfuscation or you know is this uh, is this a way to kind of uh, maybe uh, offer at least a little bit of, of obscurity security through obscurity for your for your signal? Uh, could you design a receiver that didn't care if you were using space time or space frequency that just searched through and found it? Um, you know, is there, in other words, a flexible receiver architecture. Um, so those are some some questions that we that we had, and and we're starting to to try to look through any sort of literature to see if there's if there's anything there. And that's it. So I'll stop sharing and and answer answer any questions or. Uh, but, and also, I'd I'd really like to hear from everybody, like what what their uh, kind of what their level of familiarity with this is, and and what they'd like to talk about next, and, and any feedback on on any of this and directions uh, to go in. Uh, so so to sort sort of open that, I'd like to invite uh, Daniel to to tell us uh, where you're from and how you found out about the the meetup and and what you think, uh, what you have to say. Uh, hi, Michelle. Thank you for uh, inviting me to the meetup. I found out about it through the IEEE. There was a uh, significant uh, concern that I wasn't going to get to the uh, URL for the Zoom meeting, but thank you. The question I have for you on this is for application to fast-moving uh, UAVs, and that would be Doppler shift. If the Doppler shift is unknown, uh, I'm sure it applies to satellite as well. If it's uh, you know, if you're doing a ride share, you don't really have control over your, your orbit. So you may not be familiar with or may not have the orbital parameters and be able to predict in advance the Doppler shifts. How do you account for that? Oh, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, so for for particular Doppler shift, uh, I probably defer to, to Paul uh, to answer questions about that. Um, the worst Doppler shift for for space, I'm I'm pretty sure is going to be at at low Earth orbit, or the low Earth orbit component of a of a highly elliptical orbit uh, satellite, and I'm reasonably sure that 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 amount of Doppler um, may be rivaled by the by some of the terrestrial uh, sort of channel models that we've seen. Um, so this is mentioned in the the five gigahertz. Uh, work and that um, when we when we look at Doppler and the the challenges for Doppler that there there are a couple of models that uh, that cellular uh, terrestrial cellular uses and one of them is a high-speed train and they have a, a particular scenario where it's a 350 um, you know it's a 350 kilometers per hour train going by you at not a very large distance and you're required to kind of accommodate that Doppler. So the way that you deal with that um, is is you, you have to make sure that, that things like your cyclic prefix are, are selected correctly. Um, so that's the guidance that we've that we're going to take uh, from from this for this. Uh, and uh, in the FlexLink specification in the GitHub, uh, Doppler is is addressed directly, and the the choices for for all of the uh, numbers are 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 gone through, so that's that's something that that we're aware of and and have uh, started to include in in the specifications. Uh, so so the sort of the durability of the signal is is it has to be in the 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 actual structure of the the framing and all. So Doppler is a huge concern. Um, much more so for for low Earth orbit. So uh, applications that involve uh, highly elliptical orbit, you you 
have the opportunity to say, okay, we're just going to turn off our system for the the approach to the earth where it's low altitude. And then the higher altitude sections of that particular uh, orbit, we're going to turn back on because it's much slower. The Doppler is much more kind. Uh, and then, of course, for, for GEO, it's uh, really not, not bad at all. Uh, so within like like space applications, the Doppler requirements can vary tremendously. They can be uh, stringent uh, or 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 quite benign, depending on the part of the orbit. So I'll pause and let let Paul uh, correct me on on any of this that I've got wrong or add to it. I didn't hear anything wrong, um, but I do have some stuff to add. Um, it's true that if you're in our ride share, you would not have control over the orbit. However, you would still know the orbital parameters. Uh, every non-classified satellite uh, has published orbital parameters for a relatively low resolution model. Uh, you will not get perfect Dopp Doppler correction that way, but you'll get very good Doppler correction that way. And uh, you would, even if you had officially uh, more accurate elements, you'd probably still need to be able to compensate for some residual Doppler. So the problem is not a large one, not, you don't have no idea where the satellite is. You don't, uh, you actually have a pretty good idea what the satellite motion is like, and you can do a lot of pre-compensation. Uh, the exception would be for classified payloads, uh, whether there's any chance of something like this ever showing up on a classified payload, <laughs> I don't know. But if it did, there'd have to be some negotiation. Uh, if it's a classified payload where they don't want to publish elements, then they probably wouldn't want a payload like this either. Um, so I don't think there's actually uh, any scenario that I can think of where you wouldn't know at least the normal precision uh, Keplerian elements for prediction. Well, thanks. The uh, then maybe on a, on a different tangent. What about uh, using more than two elements in the array? Is that something to which this algorithm can be extended? For example, if you went by a um, a, a sixteen by sixteen array. Yes, um, space frequency block coding can be extended to um, to larger MIMO or multiple in multiple output. Uh, so the I'm. Most I've worked through the math for two by one, which is our particular use case where it's only two transmit antennas and one receive antenna. And I've worked through the math for four transmit antennas and one receive antenna. Uh, but this technique extends upward into um, massive MIMO. Um, I didn't find too many published like uh, implementations of it, uh, but you can see how it extends upward in this this technique uh, allows you to get some uh, additional resiliency to, to defeat uh, some damage from, from multipath. So it's not restricted to two by one. That's just our particular use case and, and what we're going to uh, prototype and, and demonstrate over the air. If one wanted to add circular polarization at the antenna, would that be uh, something that would be invisible to the algorithm? Or could it be utilized in the algorithm for additional um, power at recovery at reception and or transmit? That's an interesting question. So my sort of my knee jerk response is that the polarization at the antenna uh, doesn't break this or matter very much. Uh, but but I want to be very cautious and and just <laughs> saying that. So I don't know. I can. There's some people that are that are. Uh, good at this that I can ask to see if there's any way to use this math and then take advantage of of something like uh, polarization diversity. So that's a, just another type of, of transmit diversity. Um, so far, like all of the the reading that I've done and the the work that I've done is assumed that the the polarization of the transmit antennas is all the same. Um, but you know, as we know, we we've seen that uh, that polarization diversity can be can give you an advantage. Um, so I don't think it would break it. Um, the I think that that would that would make the receive antennas job much harder. 
if if it had to uh, deal with uh, different uh, polarizations. If everything was circularly polarized, though, I I don't see I don't see a problem. And then maybe in a, along that same question is uh, beam forming. Uh, is that sort of an, a thing that is it also invisible to the algorithm, but can be used to concentrate power in the direction of the receiver um, or uh, where the sender is uh, from a receive side, where the sender is expected to minimize interfering sources? Yeah, in fact, this technique relies on on transmit beamforming as the, that that's that's like that gives you the power uh, to to do this. The on the receiver, what it does is it multiplies the received signal uh, by the transmit beamformer, essentially the equation. And the the reason the way that it gets the information um, in order to be able to to sort of exploit. Uh, beamforming is from the pilot and reference signals in OFDM. So what we're what you have to kind of assume in order to do equalization, you you can you can do space frequency block coding um, without equalizing, sort of, uh, but it's much more powerful if you go ahead and use the channel information that you have from essentially the beams. And you know, so you you know from your protocol that you're getting these reference or pilots or beacon signals at a regular interval at regular spaces in your bandwidth, and you're looking at that uh, those values. You're like, oh, okay, this is this is what how the channel's going. Some of these subcarriers are terrible. Some of them are great, uh, and then you use that information to to essentially project uh, along the the transmit. You know, you're using transmit beamforming in order to to get equalized results out of the combination of signals from the transmitter. So I, I I would say that it's a resounding yes to your question. That that's exactly what this is doing. Um and I mean you can you can limp along and get something out of this in a very simple way by not doing that, by not equalizing your signals, but you'd be kind of it'd be kind of silly not to to go ahead and take advantage of that sort of information. This is this is how it it really shines is is when you when you use that information um, and use transmit beamforming to to extract the the original samples. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, and it there's a uh, for the paper that's in VTools media section. We try really hard to kind of explain that, uh, and it ended up in sort of the appendix for now uh, to to kind of walk through the the math. Um, so some if there's any. Uh, feedback that you can give in terms of like, did this, is this clear enough? Is it a good enough explanation uh, would be super helpful. Uh, the VTools media section is referred, it is referenced. I don't know what the URL is for that. Oh, that's the VTools um, meeting announcement. I'll, I'll send it back out again. It's the um, IEEE events are organized through something called VTools, which stands for volunteer tools. And that's how we like put together um, the the event announcements to go out to things like their information theory chapter or any of the affinity groups or or to the section. Uh, yeah, I, actually, that's how how I found out about the meeting, I guess. But I the if if it's in the invite, then I'll be able to find the URL. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's in the it's in the invite or thank you. Better it better be. It was intended to be. Uh, and then <laughs> I'll you. also send out the paper to everybody uh, directly as well, just to make it uh, super easy. So yeah, right. the 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 sort of stuff is um, well, you know, things worth doing are rarely easy, and this is <laughs> can get kind of tricky. What we really want to do is like put it in uh, sort of accessible language, clear terms to show you the value. Uh, what we're at kind of after uh, with the sort of design so that, um, you know, when people see it in, in either like a workplace or or in ac academic literature, that they're not, uh, you know, confused or or kind of thrown. This is it It has, does have a lot of of it makes a lot of sense, uh, uh, but doesn't tend to be explained terribly well. What I what I found when I was trying to work through this in order to implement this part of the design was that space time block coding was explained and there's a number of uh, like YouTube videos and and some papers and I read them and I got it but I was like okay well what's the difference between the space time and the space frequency and the very compact 
language and some of the papers kind of threw me. It wasn't clear. It sort at first it sounded like you were uh, you had subcarriers, not the subcarriers from OFDM, but you were using completely different subcarriers at the transmitter. And that's not the case. So in order to prevent anybody else from being confused, we we wanted to make this uh, really well documented and described. So that's kind of what we're after for this. Uh, and also to have a working uh, implementation for people to to see and, uh, you know, take, because uh, most of the stuff is is proprietary. It's in cellular systems. Um, you know, so exposing it and kind of making it uh, easily accessible is, is the goal. Great. Looking Now, there's also something called Neptune. That's, is that the next part of this? Yeah, Neptune's the overall project name for the yeah. drone uh, project. So Neptune's just the name of the project name. Uh, so all of the OFDM from the creation of the, the data, uh, right now it's physical link specification. So FlexLink mm -hmm. and, and the TrueFlight spec are that the physical layer right now. Um, and obviously we'll, we'll need some higher, higher layers in order to actually uh, you know, make a drone fly around. That would be that'd be really great. So yeah, Neptune's just the project name for the for the uh, for this aerospace and drone uh, communications. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. And then Ken, did you have any any questions or any feedback? I I'd like to thank you for um, making it possible to talk with uh, some of the local cellular folks in San Diego to kind of clear up some confusion and to get some some really good advice about things like the hybrid ARQ. So we'll we'll be implementing that uh, for uh, correcting errors. Uh, so thank you for the introductions and uh, you have the floor. Oh, I don't have anything in particular. The Doppler discussion that you had for Leo sounded accurate compared to what I remember from the uh, Global Star days. So, but uh, yeah, just following along here. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think that based on the, the question, um, I think a discussion or, or kind of a documentation of, uh, you know, which parts of the specification have to do with with kind of accommodating Doppler would be good. I, I'm pretty sure that the earlier specification for FlexLink um, had the walkthrough of like, okay, so we know we have a Doppler, uh, essentially a do Doppler requirement of of X, you know, meters per second or whatever. And, and which part of the OFDM frame is the most, uh, wh like wh what breaks first? Uh, and I thought that was a pr pretty good description. I'm not sure if it's in the most recent uh, version. So, so I'm going to take it as an action item to go back and look at that and then uh, surface that as maybe a, a separate discussion and, and make sure it's documented. Because Doppler is a big deal, especially with drones. And the, every couple of months they get faster. And they are, you know, the fastest ones are are about as fast as a, as a high-speed train. So... You know, if we if we want this to work for for drones, it needs to work for all for all of the use cases. All right, any any other questions or comments? We'll do, we will be doing this again. This is not the only time, uh, but but anything I can answer today. Maybe one more question, Michelle. Oh was sure. There a, was there did I, maybe I missed part of the presentation? Um, I understood it to be starting at the top of the hour, but I guess it started before I joined. Is that the case? What happened here? I think we started at about right about ten. You 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 joined at the beginning because there was a uh, the other participant mentioned uh, AirCube. I don't know. I didn't hear anything about AirCube. Is that? Oh, I don't yes. recall. I don't recall anything about AirCube. Paul, do you recall anything? And no. The, the the participant that you asked the question. The other the other audience member. Um, maybe. Ken had mentioned something about a prior discussion that was had. Um, I think he commented about uh, how the the your your question about uh, um, a Doppler related to to Global Star, uh, but that's all I heard. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I was just going based off prior my own personal prior experience. I had a Thank previous you. Uh, yeah previous work in that area. So. 
Yeah, you didn't you didn't miss anything at all. Oh, it, great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't want that to happen. Cool. Okay, so please uh, check out the uh, the article and suggest improvements. We uh, we actively seek uh, comment and critique, um, and appreciate any improvements that we can kind of make in order to explain this. Um, any suggestions for for like future work or uh, any projects in San Diego that uh, that might want to to present uh, through the this local group, um, and then we'll 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 publish everything and and just keep at it. So uh, thank you everybody for for making this meeting uh, very successful, and uh, look forward to the next one. Looking forward to it as well. Thanks, Michelle. You bet.